Welcome to Capes, Cows and Masks, the show where we uncover the world of soups and science fiction. I'm Jake Hart. And I'm David Oscar. And on today's show, we're going to be looking at the DC animated movies, their legacy, why they resonate with fans so much, comparing them to the live action, and more. But when preparing this episode, I started thinking, I can't do this show without bringing a certain guest on. So... Without further ado, please welcome director, writer, and the biggest Batman fan out there, Rob Ayling. How you doing, Rob? What a lovely introduction. I would, I'll take it though. I, I guess I'm the biggest Batman fan, or one of at least. So um, yeah, I'll take it. Thank you. Um, I'm doing very well, thanks, mate. How are you doing? How are you doing, guys? Yeah, not too bad, man. Keeping ourselves busy with all the content coming out, WandaVision and other shows that we're excited for but yeah pretty you know it, all things considered in the world we're in right now i'm doing pretty good how about you dave yeah not too bad like i said we've got you know one division which is you know keeping us occupied and lots of other stuff to look forward to and, and keep us busy at the moment so yeah the, the sun is coming up on a new day hopefully it, it's gonna get better guys it's gonna get better <laughs> so yeah when thinking about what this show is going to be me and Dave realized, oh, there's a new DC animated movie coming out towards the end of January, and that is Batman Soul of the Dragon. So I thought it'd be really good to do an episode looking back at the DC animated movies as a whole. Like As you said, Rob, before we started recording, there's 40 of these films, quite an overwhelming amount that they've been producing since 2007. A disclaimer, this does not include the animated films that are associated to the animated series with uh, Kevin Conroy and Tim Daly and all that aspect. And this also doesn't include the Adam West ones as well. So this is just the DC Direct to Video ones. So I'm going to start with you, Rob. What is your relationship to these DC animated films? Obviously, you're a huge DC nut, Batman being your favorite character and stuff like that. But what is your relationship to these animated films? I think for me, the big relationship I have with these particular movies is that they're essentially getting these characters right. You know, they are they are bringing a level of authenticity to what the writers of the DC have been doing for years. And they are just bringing these characters to life in short and sweet stories, really, because I think the the films themselves are, you know, 70 plus minutes i don't think they go overboard the 80 minute mark as far as i'm aware for most of them and if they do like you know dark knight returns parts one and part two which we'll get into you know there is a you know specific reason for story wise and my relationship to them is just simply this is just that they are bringing authenticity and something stronger story wise that the the feature length live action films are somewhat missing at the moment i feel you know and it's not just because they're bringing comic books to life you know because they've already shown with other projects within this catalog of library of films here that they've got that they can tell an original tale as well within that as well um especially with some of the you know justice league ones or even the assault on us um um, on arkham asylum you know they, they are willing to tell just really good stories in a short space amount of time yeah i've always found these interesting because a lot of them like with other comic book properties will be a template or like a test for what you see in like live action a lot of the time as well and they work pretty well for fans in that some people might demand certain storylines or be familiar with them in tv shows or when they adapt them in film because they've seen them as the animated versions so for those who aren't big on comic books or are just getting into them then they're a good way for people to sort of familiarize themselves and learn about the history and the big storylines and the characters through these films and especially for dc you know animation has always been a big part of their media so you know, stemming from the days of like Batman, the animated series, etc. It kind of does make sense. And it's nice that they do still have that. So I've always sort of appreciated them for being there, that you can sort of fill those holes that might have been there previously, where you're getting big gaps in cinematic releases, or even in the days in which we had fewer comic book movies. So 
they definitely are good for that. They, you know, scratch that itch. They give you a lot of, you know, fun, crazy moments and also a lot of stuff that you wouldn't see in the films in which they're like, hey, let's look at this alternate reality. Let's look at this character in a completely different way. And or just even characters that we've not even met or probably would never meet like really, you know, lower tier sort of characters. So they're very interesting in, in that sort of way. Like we said, you know, we'll get on to later. I'm sure like the quality is, you know, very like questionable sometimes. Um, and they do have that sort of directed DVD feel with a lot of them as well. But again, I still appreciate that dedication from DC to stick to having that animation division and doing these stories. And in many ways, like with Suicide Squad and Wonder Woman, they seem to be like, well, let's just test if this character works. And a lot of the times that animated film will be a lot like the film that you actually see as well, which is interesting. Yeah, I sort of echo both a lot of your thoughts. To go back to what Rob said, I think the with a lot of them, they're a perfect representation of the characters from the comics that us comic fans, you know, grew up with and read all during childhood and stuff like that. But like you said, Dave, it's also for people who aren't into comics, it's a great way of introducing people to these characters because, you know, as you said, Rob, the DC live action universe so far has had a few bumps in the road. You know, it's not universally praised like the Marvel Cinematic Universe for all sorts of different reasons. But I feel as if with the animated movies, if someone's looking, oh, I just want a really good representation of Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman, I always go, well, have you ever checked out the animated films? Because they normally contain the best representations of these characters. They normally do the biggest storylines of these characters, the ones that had the most impact. So I've always had a really good relationship with them. I've enjoyed most of them. I think it's because I had a huge foundation of the original Batman the Animated Series and then Superman and Justice League. So that was all there from my childhood. And I think DC as well looked at that and go, we've built a really strong foundation of hardcore animated fans with this universe. And the fact that they can make direct-to-video films, there's a lot less risk than chucking it on a movie theater. And I will bring up the theatrical aspect of it as well, but I think there's you can explore so many different storylines, so many different characters, different variations of these characters, because there's no risk at all, really. You've just made this for... You know, there's still a budget involved, but I think so far they've proven that they've done quite well with the budget in terms of the quality of animation. At times it's a little shoddy, but it gives you the opportunity to like what they kind of want to do now with the live action films, have this multiverse effect where, you know, if you want to see Batman in his older times, you've got the Dark Knight films, you've got year one for his earlier stuff, Superman, that there's all sorts of different stuff that you can just pop in and out and go, oh, that was a really good story. As you said, Rob, short and sweet, and you don't have to worry about this larger universe at play. But Rob, do you, do you feel as if it's the characterizations and the sticking to the source material for a lot of them that resonates with the fans so much maybe compared to the live action stuff i do think so yeah i think many people for years have, have like craved for you know a lot of these stories that have, that have been made into these animated movies to be you know into live action form like for example i remember they said they wanted to do a darren aronofsky's batman year one but we didn't get that in the end but we eventually got batman begins and you know look great film don't get it wrong, we get the Dark Knight trilogy, even better. But then eventually down the line, you know, there is still the possibility of we can still bring that story to life, maybe not in live action form, because, you know, that is a completely different route that they've gone down now, but they can do that in animated form. And what they've been able to do now is, you're absolutely right with the history of the Warner Brother animations as well. They've built up a, a respectable reputation of, being able to produce good quality animation. I mean, we could spend ages talking about the animated TV series, and that's not what this is about. But the, some of the animation work on that is still some of the best animation that we've seen the Warner Brothers animation produce. And they've con they've they've gone even further beyond that with these direct to DVD films that they've done now. There's some animation in the, in these films where you look at it and go, "Wow, that is beautiful. That is gorgeous." If anything, it's a it's a you know, a showcase of animators at work really the most is that you can really bring the pages to life, you know, and that th I think is such a key thing for any audience member that watches these films is I just want to see the pages 
be brought to life. You know, that's why, you know, they want to see Year One. They want to see Dark Knight Returns. They want to see All-Star Superman, which, you know, you and I, we can argue back and forth, is probably the best Superman story. But audiences are craving the stories that they grew up with or they're, they're just, you know, discovering now and they just want to see it jump out of the page with them. And Warner Brothers have now got almost this workflow or this um, circuit of actually, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they've, they've got a system, you know, it's almost like one in, one out kind of thing. And, and I guess that's where you get a few glitches in the matrix here and there of, you know, um, you know the, cons- the quality kind of dr- uh, dropping a little bit. That does happen, and it's with some of the best, you know, graphic novels out there, and some of it is some with the probably the lesser known story. Let's... Me personally, I found that the the better DC animated films are the straight up adata- adaptations, the Dark Knight Returns, Year One, Under the Red Hood. They seem to be like they looked at the original source material, treated it with the uttermost respect and gone, let's just bring this to life. Like, we don't need to improve on this in any way because it's pretty much perfect. While some of their original stories, I'm, I'm a bit like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure about those. Uh, but where do you sort of land on them? I suppose for me, like, I'm not as much a big DC guy, especially for, like, comics and original stories. So I'm more, like, no familiar with it when it comes to, like, Marvel uh, comic storylines so that's where i said earlier like it could be an entry point because that's been the case for me with a lot of these stories as well so and i'm as we'll come on to later i'm not as big a batman fan <laughs> as other people so i guess then there hasn't been that need to like oh i need to watch you one etc um because you know I, i've just never been like drawn to those stories as much so in some ways i do find that the original ones i'm more drawn to because i'm like where's people will like go on about these storylines i'm like so like killing joke for example um i hadn't read that but then uh, everyone was talking about it and they say oh they're making it into an animated film um, but then i didn't watch it because then i hear all the bad stuff about the the sort of messed up stuff that happens in that so i was like okay i'll avoid that and I suppose that then maybe tarnished the view on the rest of them, perhaps. Um, whereas I felt that the ones that were the original ones or that were adapting sort of like the smaller stories or with more unique characters, I thought, oh, well, that looks fun or that would be interesting. You know, I kind of like to sort of support the underdog and to to see these like original new stories because they can be more creative with them and they can be more sort of open. So... I think it's 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 good to have the blend. I'm not saying that they should go one way or the other, that they should only do adaptations or they should only do originals. I think it's good to like keep it mixed up. Um, but I don't like the idea that they only, okay, we can only ever do the big comic book storylines. Uh, because to me as well, even as somebody who might have not read those storylines, I can still watch something and feel like this just seems like it's really been squeezed into like a condensed amount of time. So, like you said earlier, Rob, you know, certain ones, if they're able to put it into a part one, two, then that's perfect. But with other ones, like I think, like, so maybe Death of Superman or something, to me, I was like, wow, this feels like really squeezed in. You know, they did a pretty good job with it. But for the death of a character and to sort of, if you're watching that, say the first Superman animated film, then to sort of like get on board with that character, get into the relationship and then feel the effects of the death as well as all the crazy action, is quite a lot for, like, just over 60 minutes. So I think it's sometimes, obviously, with other storylines, people will be like, and like you said, you know, the the comic books are obviously the the better version of it anyway, so I suppose why not play with stuff? I also think it's worth noting that they seem to have built a family there. You know, we talk a lot about the MCU and how they built, like, a really family of filmmakers and stuff like that. But I was looking, you know, watching these films and having a look in the credits. If you look at the directors, there's a lot of rep- uh, repeated directors. Like, one's pointed out is um, Lauren Montgomery. She doesn't seem to get enough praise because she's done eight of them. Uh, she did some of, like, the first few of them. And we have legendary animation director Sam Liu, who has done 17 of them, which is crazy to think. And then uh, Jay Oliver, yeah, who's uh, a newcomer into the game, but he's already done eight of them. And I also want to give a shout out to Andrea Romano, who has been there since the very, very beginning. Now, we're talking back to Batman the Animated Series, and she is the voice uh, director and the, and the casting, voice casting director as well. She's been there since the very beginning, and she seems to have seen out 
all her career in animation and she's done a bang up job because as you said Dave earlier on if there's one thing that the DC animated stuff get right most of the time it's the voice cast I mean obviously we have the legend that is Kevin Conroy but in, e in each of the era of the films they seem to nail it so what do you think about Andrew Romano's impact and also like the directors and the family they've created there rob um i think for me you're, you've hit the nail on the head with andrea romana though because i mean there's a phrase that she always says in interviews which is when it comes to casting it's not you're finding an actor to just do a voice you're finding an actor to do a voice with character and that's a consistent thing that she says all the time and that is absolutely true like when it comes to just casting any actor or any performer really with with any context because as you said like she just hits the nail on the head in terms of the casting with um I, I, I don't know what more I can say really apart from the fact that you have to be able to imagine like if you close your eyes you can actually see the image in front of you you know you can close your eyes and you hear the voice and you know who that is straight away you know that you can do that with Kevin Conroy now enough but like if you were able to close your eyes and you hear someone's voice, you could th then put that to, you know, another character. Like, there are certain casting choices that they've made over time, which, for me, have been questionable. Like, was it just because they, you know, they thought, you know, maybe that could give them an extra boost in, you know, sales or something? I don't know. You know, for me, I think the, the most genius casting choice, because I think, while I think he would have made an incredible Lex Luthor, I think Brian Cranston gives an absolutely superb performance as as gordon in batman year one like for me he is the stand standout character in that novel to have him be the voice of jim gordon and it because most people think it's a batman story first and foremost it's not it's a jim gordon story so you need you know a high caliber actor there and this was you know peak of breaking bad as well I guess the other thing we should put into question as well, which I, th I feel is really harsh sometimes when people say, oh, it's a direct-to-DVD, so it's going to be so-and-so. It's going to be a particular standard. In lesser quality, they got Brian Cranston. They've had, and obviously Kevin Conroy. They've had Mark Hamill do Joker for The Killing Joke. They've had Clancy Brown. They've had Rosario Dawson. Exact They've had some really, really stellar actors come on board and give some incredible performances and that comes back to Andrea Romano which is that the philosophy she has within it which is you cast for a voice for character you know and you know there's not much more I can say about that she's 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 incredible at her job. Uh, Dave where are you at with like the the voice cast? Yeah like, like you guys said I think that a lot of the time that they really work and if you close your eyes like that's how you envision the character or if you're reading a comic book then that's the voice that you hear. So I think obviously Kevin Conroy is definitely one of those. And interestingly, sometimes I watch these films and it's, it is a bit weird or jarring sometimes because the voices change as well. So you get like a different Superman mm. in certain films. And it's a bit more understandable if the animation style changes, but sometimes it doesn't and you're a bit like, oh. But um, one I think that works really well actually is Jason O'Mara as Batman. I think that he becomes like just as recognizable as kevin conroy in a way and i think that he works really well for the character so i think that that that's like a great choice as well you had alfred molina as uh as aries in <laughs> the wonder woman which is like interesting as well considering he's been like a marvel villain as well so yeah i think that usually they seem to to, to get it pretty spot on i do though have to question some of the accents that go on during this I, i'm still, constantine's accent does bug the hell out of me i gotta be honest i'm like is this guy british or like i searched him up thinking he was a bigger name but it is his biggest credits are pretty much these films i think it happened a bit with harley quinn as well sometimes i'm a bit like they're trying to do the sort of accent and i'm not sure it always works because you haven't got like the original voice actress just kills it and i think anybody who then attempts that afterwards you're like uh it, it's a bit hit and miss like some of them are great some of them are fantastic like i think kaylee cuoco in the series does like a great job um but then some of these films i'm a bit like uh, it just sounds like a, an impression it doesn't sound like an actual performance ladies gentlemen you've eaten well you've eaten gotham's wealth its spirit but your feast is nearly over. From this moment on, 
None of you are safe. Let's sort of like talk about the quality aspect of this. You know, the consistency of quality. Like, Rob, would you say what would what would you say is their consistency rate? Like, I would say, on a whole, I think there's for me there's some bias towards these animated films having been a fan of the comics. And so that there is a bit of like fandom involved of being like, oh, you know, seeing these live action and, and actually moving in front of me. Um, so I might give them a bit of leeway. But, you know, there have been some which I've been like, oh, wow, that's that's not good at all. Like, and stuff like that. So what do you think of their consistency and, and quality? I feel like at times they do play it incredibly safe with some of their animation styles because they, they do have a style now. They have a they can either revert back to the Bruce Tim art direction, you know, with things like Batman and Harley Quinn, you know, because that is set in that universe. Yeah, I know, I know, it's rough, it's rough. Um, but then they will take some creative risks as well. But to jump back to playing it safe, it still astounds me even now that they didn't really fully embrace the artwork of Jim Lee for Batman Hush. And I find that really bizarre, you know, like... There are, you know, there are certain attributes, you know, like the Joker's facial expressions, for example. I could see that jumping off the page. But then I'm looking at the rest of it and I'm like, Jim Lee's art is, you know, incredibly detailed. It's incredibly sharp and it's, you know, it's iconic. You know, you look at a Jim um, Lee piece of art and you know it's Jim Lee, you know, straight away. But then you look at year one. They're matching the art style of the comic. Yeah, the Dark Knight Returns. They're matching the the artwork of Frank Miller, and it's it's astounding that they will sometimes. But I think it's because it is the audience expectation jumping at them that they don't want to. Let's put it bluntly: they don't want to fuck it up. Basically, they they don't want to let the audience down. And sadly, on occasion, they have let them down. Like. Apart from the first 45 minutes, you know, of The Killing Joke, because they do feel like, and someone mentioned this, I think it might have been you, David, whether it's the, you know, there's the expectations of the comic, but then it's trying to do something new and fresh with it. But look, The Killing Joke is of its time. It's set in the 80s. It was a product of its time. And and I'm not justifying that is why the representation of Batgirl is the way it is, because even Alan Moore to this day has regretted the way that Batgirl is treated in that book. But that does not excuse you to try and... Because essentially what they end up doing is offending the character and offending the audience by adding on a 45-minute long, tacked-on adventure of why she's so complicated and why Joker goes after to, to Batgirl and, you know, that well, he, does, he, he doesn't know that she's Batgirl, that's what I mean, but, like, um, why she retires and all these other different threads and why they... Why Batman cares for Batgirl because they slept together on a rooftop one time. It's just Ugh. all unnecessary. It just feels like a fanboy's wet dream. That's just the <laughs> best way of putting it. It just feels like a wet dream. And you're, it's really uncomfortable watching it. And that's where I think the expectation thing plays into the balance of, you know, they people have been watching a lot of these director animated movies now, they know the style, they know the expectation. How can we push it even further? And that is an extreme example where they went too far. They went too far over the, right, we need to make this modern, we need to make this relatable, but we also need to rectify um, some of the stuff that was seen as a bad thing. Whereas people, at least from my perspective of things, the, the Killing Joke is a divisive book. That is the real big thing about it. It's supposed to be... Di di you, you're not going to be universally praised. That is, that is Alan Moore's thing, though. It, exactly. To be divisive. Like, that, you know, what do people expect when you got Alan Moore as the writer? Like Exactly. It's supposed to be di di divisive. So why change that? You know, and if you... And again, it's not so much to, them to question whether or not they're fans of it or not, because they are. They care about this material enough because they're willing to take the risk and actually match the art style with other projects. So as we mentioned with The Dark Knight Returns, you know, that's probably been their most, you know, the one, because most people say that that is the godfather of gra graphic novels, of Batman graphic novels anyway. In, to, to match the art style is one thing, but also to make sure that you, heat beat, you hit beat for beat the, the, the story of that, so you don't miss anything out, is so vital to that story. And 
yet, while it is still set in the 80s, it's still incredibly current to the times we are living in now. Even in this pandemic that we're living in right now, the, that story still resonates with audiences. But I wish, you know, over time, DC would think more about playing the... the in, in terms of the animation department, I wish they took more risks in actually trying to match the style or actually coming up with something completely, you know, different entirely, which does tie in within this. I know Batman Ninja doesn't tie in within this, but actually it's a beautiful looking film. You know, it's incredibly over the top. It's incredibly lavish. And yeah, the finale is absolutely bonkers. But I wish that they did something like that within these movies as well. And I think that, yeah, the the, the overall point of it is they they do have a safe ground with their their animation right now which i think they need to break out of if they really want to you know be getting out there more dave what do you think because i know you have more of an issue with the fluctuation in quality don't you yeah i suppose it comes back to a bit of what i said earlier with that direct dvd feel which again is you know you can't pin on them too much because at the end of the day you know that's probably the budget and the the limitations um, that they have been given um, but it does come across as weird uh, like Rob said when they try to meddle with stuff as well especially considering somebody like Bruce Tim is involved with a lot of these so considering he was involved in the killing joke you're like what you know this is a character who's like helped to put like Batgirl on like you know a bigger platform for audiences and Batman and that kind of stuff so it's a bit weird that he does does that and yeah, I think that there's also that element of where we were saying about like the art style and the animation quality. It's it's strange to me that sometimes you can watch these films and be like, oh, wow, that's like a really good shot. Or, that's a really good piece of animation. Whereas then other times you're like, wow, that looks really bad. So it's, it's weird how you can just get it from like one scene to a next. It can fluctuate so much. So often, you know, animation will be done cheaply for like certain reasons whether it be characters just like the same frame is revolving around and around again or the way that they're running or the way that the action's happening it just looks like they're being like slided around the screen obviously they don't use as many cheap shortcuts as they do in say like television series etc as they do here but there is still an element of that sometimes where you're a bit like oh yeah i can see where they've just sort of like masked that big fight scene by just putting an explosion or a big laser beam or something like that but it is surprising that then sometimes you can have these like really nuanced and beautiful shots of you know like certain items or sunsets or um when there is an action scene and you get like you know shattered glass or something so it's a bit weird and a bit jarring that you're like oh well if you could do it here why didn't you do it for the rest of rest of the movie but um i guess again that's probably just time and where you know somebody is they're working on that shot and they, they put that extra effort in, whereas maybe another day they don't have the time or, or budget to do that. So, yeah, and I think, again, it just comes down to the idea of, like, you're cramming something into 60 minutes, whereas, like, Apocalypse War, it had, like, an hour and a half to, to sort of play with, at least, whereas when you have to cram something into about 70 minutes, it's a lot harder to, to squeeze all of that story in, especially when you are... Because... I think one of my biggest problems sometimes as well is that these films feel, and Rob talked about it a bit earlier as well, is that they sort of feel the same because they're very much like, oh, let's put everyone in here because the fans will love to see that character and that character and we have to have the Justice League. Oh, and we'll have the Teen Titans and we'll have... And it, it becomes a bit like, whoa, you know, can we not just have a, a story about this one character? And we'll get onto this, obviously, but that does only tend to really happen for the likes of Batman and Superman. So it's a shame sometimes that you don't get these more focused individual stories. They always have to be about the Justice League, the Teen Titans, mm -hmm. these big teams. And it just feels then that you haven't got time with any one particular character because they're so many crammed in. And, and it's a bit odd in that way. You're like, well, why, if you have this constrained time, would you throw so many so many characters in there it does feel a bit like you know everything in the kitchen sink kind of mentality and yeah and when it comes to like obviously the worst of them like batman and harley quinn that one i think is a very bad example for, you know for the, the quality for one but even with the the action of that you've got like a character two characters like ivy and harley quinn 
and I don't think she even uses her hammer or mallet in that film. And Poison Ivy doesn't even really seem to use like her vines or anything. They just saw fist fight throughout the entire thing. And I'm like, why would you have these two characters and not have their use use their like supernatural powers? So it's really odd when they make decisions like that as well. But again, it might just be a budget thing. But yeah, it just goes to show that when they really focus on what they set out to do what they want to do like in apocalypse war it can work out to their benefit so that the chaos and the 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 big action can work to their advantage there because they're still able to tell the storyline alongside it but other times it just comes across as this is just action for the sake of action and we're just throwing all these characters in so that they will look good on a trailer or in a behind the scenes or real i think there's an element to all of that i think the biggest issue is budget and it's it's a bigger issue, I think, in Hollywood in general and the studio system that f- some studios do see and some executives do see animation as a lesser form of art. Do you know what I mean? So uh, they, they tend to go, well, it's just animation, so we don't need to pump so much money into it and you've only got so much time to do it, you know, sort of thing, because they see it as just a very quick return for them. But I think w- what they do... the they're doing the best they can with the budget they're given. And I think given the time, given the budget, they would produce more theatrical, cinematic style animated films. Like, I think they probably made a very good case when they were pitching The Dark Knight Returns to the execs. Like, look, this we're planning on making this effectively a two and a half hour movie. It's going to be it's going to be animated and shot like a film. It's going to feel cinematic. We're going to get Christopher Drake to come on and do an incredibly cinematic score for it. Like, it's just in, like, it feels like Hans Zimmer could have written something like that. So they would have gone, okay, well, all right, it, this storyline deserves this type of feel. But I feel as if they don't give the time and the budget to the rest of them. So then you fall into the pitfalls of like, okay, well, we'll just have the big action sequences here because, you know, that will bring in fans and stuff like that. And if there's also an element of like, well, if it's animation, it's more directed towards children. So we need more action set pieces rather than pieces of dialogue. Going to what you said, Dave, about, you know, throwing all the characters in there. I think there is an expectation. And I also think there's there's a feeling that these films are for the people who know these characters in and out, who have read these stories. I think there's an expectation that people who watch these films are already familiar with these stories, are already very familiar with these characters. So they don't, you know, they already have that baggage going into this. They don't need each character's sort of origin explained like that. But I do see where you're coming from that if you want to bring in new people, new fans to to introduce them to these characters. If you just throw in 30 characters into a Justice League film, you, you're going to be like, well, what, uh, so who's my favorite character? Because like, they only got like five seconds to actually do anything. Like, I wanted to sort of go back to what I said as well about you know, executives and you know, people thinking that animation is more geared towards a younger audience. In saying that, though, I want to talk about how as these films have progressed, I've noticed they've gotten more adult-themed that there's definitely more sort of thematic messages that only really adults understand and also the imagery the graphic violence the the you know the spraying of blood i feel as if as the films have been going on they've been more geared towards adults what do you guys think of this because we are in a new era of animation i think i feel as if now animation as a whole is not frowned upon it's not looked at as in oh that's just for kids because we've seen big successes with um, you know, sp- it's into the Spider Verse and how you know that was a huge step for animation um, and superhero animation, especially. So, but what do you feel as if DC are doing with the you know the the kid friendly stuff and the more adult stuff? Where do you go with that, Rob? Ooh, good question. On the one hand, I think they're trying to cater to both. Ultimately, you know, they're trying to cater to younger audiences, but they're also trying to cater to the hardcore fans as well because you know if they don't like these movies they can go elsewhere to you know like where there's the brighter colorful you know a representation of these characters or they can they can appreciate the darker tone of these films because ultimately that's what we're seeing in live action form right now generally speaking and i would say probably even more so now over the last year children are becoming more aware of violent imagery and more aware of 
you know, darker tones on television now. You know, there is a lot of negativity going on in the media right now. There's a lot of, you know, violence out there in particular. And, you know, they are witnessing some of that. And I think even like the BBFC have been very lenient over the years in regards to grading feature films, but also these films as well. I, 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 just to quickly sidetrack, one of my favourite BBFC um, certificates was for Star Trek 2009, which was contains a few swear words and scenes with green blood. And I'd always found that to be very amusing. <laughs> like <laughs> of all the things to put on the BBFC and give a warning to children about, it's the, 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 the amount of green blood that you see on the screen. I love it. Um, <laughs> had it been red, however, it's a 15. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I feel like even now, like I think you would be doing a disservice to the characters that the creators have, you know, of these characters have done, which is, if a joke of um, uses a mug and slits someone's throat, it's not going to be a little graze. It's going to be a full on, you know, is it over the top? Yeah, of course it's over the top. But, you know, it's over dramatizing the point. You know, these are comic book movies at the end of the day. You know, they they are overly flamboyant. They are overly violent for those re reasons alone. And, you know, these these characters do suffer and they do have pain, you know. For me, I think one of the, the, the best films in this cohort of films is Under the Red Hood, which it does push the boundaries in terms of, you know, having something to feel both physically and mentally when watching it, because you feel each blow that Bruce and Jason take when they say the words to one another. You know, each line has a powerful, you know, thing towards it. And there's no violence in that moment when you th when you see it. There's a gun at play, but th no no one's throwing a fist towards that at the, the end of it all. The most impactful scene in that film is when you've got the wide shot between the two characters and in between them, is it's the Joker. And it's it's basically the big thematic thing of what is justice to you. You know, are you on the left side of it? Are you on the right side of it? Are you, you know, I'm not talking about killing um, Two-Face or anything. Or are else. you just chaos? Yeah, are you just chaos? Exactly. And... I think while they are dark themes for maybe younger viewers to watch, I think that it's not a bad thing to kind of delve into that at this certain time. And plus, you know, adults at the end of the day will have the choice whether or not they let their kids watch this or not. You know, as bad as this might sound, but my parent was very lenient on me to watch like the 89 Batman film at the age of five when it was a 15 in the UK. You know, now I think it's probably rated a 12, but all, you know, all of those things aside, I think what they are doing right now, DC animated studios in particular is they are finding a right balance between the two. Whereas I think in the past, maybe there was probably more emphasis more on the violence aspect. Whereas I think now They've realised if we're going to have to keep up with, and I can give this um, to most of the DC um, live action films and also Marvel, I suppose, as well, is at the core of it all, there has to be a heart within the story you're telling. And you can have movies like Under the Red Hood, you can have epic stories where the battle is actually just a piece of drama for the media in um, Batman The Dark Knight Returns, or you can have a big climactic battle which then ultimately ends up being someone discovering that they need to be the hero the most in Justice League War with Green Lantern and Batman. That, for me, is still my favourite scene in that movie where he just says to him, you know, you need to be bigger, you're, you're loud, you're brash, that's something you can be that I'm not. You know, and that's, that's, again, another wonderful moment within that. No violence needed whatsoever, and I think that's what's grounded within that. There still needs to be heart, is what I'm saying. But then I'm going to rectify all of that and say, well, you can also make Batman Soul of the Dragon, which is just a big punchy show up kind of thing. You know, Bond, Bruce Lee, 1970s black exploitation infused cinema, you know, film. And it can be a fun, entertaining ride. Dave, where do you where does your head go when it comes to like, you know, should they be more geared towards children or is the adult imagery, adult image, imagery you know, more the focus these days for DC? Yeah, I guess I've never really I I've never seen it as oh these are for kids. I think obviously back in the day when you were making Mask of the Phantasm and that like Mr. Freeze film and stuff like that, you know, those were obviously aimed at children. So I I guess that 
television, etc., is the more aimed at area for for young viewers in these like Batman TV shows and Spider Man TV shows, etc. Whereas to me, these direct to DVD films, especially because you know, not to sound like old guys, but in some ways, you know, DVD, Blu Ray, you know. <laughs> The kids aren't into that these days, probably. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it very much seems like they're aiming it towards that audience of the people who grew up with these characters and who are into, you know, collecting film collections and media and love comic books and the fans and grew up with the animations. So now it's kind of it's aging up with its audience like a lot of properties have done in the past. So I see it as kind of like just how, you know, they have now grown older and they've got used to more violence in other properties then it's reflected in the animation as well and what rob said as well i think there is an element of you know we've had films like deadpool and we've had a lot of like violent animation even if it's not superhero based i i always say that like rick and morty like completely changed the game in terms of animation so you get you know a a show like Big Mouth on Netflix like would never have been made like years ago with like that is so crude and crazy but Rick and Morty has like allowed people to get used to that and I think a lot of children mm. like will watch Rick and Morty even though maybe they're not supposed to and the same with Deadpool you know they'll watch Deadpool even though maybe they're not supposed to so I think there's an element here of that as well is mm. that it's become more normality i think video games probably have a big part of it as well because there's always the idea of like playing grand theft auto when you're not meant to but to me these specific films i think are more aimed at the older audience anyway so i've never seen them as something aimed at younger viewers or children i think that they are solely for the adults and that you know explains why there is the more violence the more blood etc and from what I've seen, mostly it is used in like a tasteful or understandable way. It's never used like just for the sake of it. Um, there might be certain instances where it might be a bit much or a bit silly, but it's never never done over the top or anything like that. So it, it always seems to at least be somewhat realistic. Unless there is just like, you know, the kind of, uh, what was it, the Teen Titans show of like, you know, fuck Batman. You know, sometimes there might be an element that oh, you yeah, just drop an F bomb yeah. just to be like, oh, look at us. We're like, so like. We're hard and edgy, yeah. Yeah, like in Apocalypse, yeah. oh, I did appreciate when Raven just kind of went, oh, fuck it. And like, they just, dis- you know, they teleported in that moment. So that kind of worked. But there's other times where they just drop an F bomb or say like a swear and you're like, you're just doing that just to like make it sound more cool, more edgy. I don't know if like <laughs> yeah. they actually, because sometimes it doesn't even seem like the character would have said that. So sometimes it just seems like they're doing it for the sake of it. But in terms of the actual like violence and stuff, most of that fits. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like people moaning about the Schneider cut, like, oh, Batman says fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, your moral code just won't allow for that? It's too hard to cross that line. No, God Almighty, no. It'd be too damned easy. All I've ever wanted to do is kill him. A day doesn't go by when I don't think about subjecting him to every horrendous torture he's dealt out to others, and then end him. So on Batman, I think a big question that, you know, everybody talks about, which, you know, I will I will admit it as a huge Batman fan. I'm sure Rob is probably on the same wavelength as me, but do they rely too much on Batman? There's been films that have come out that have gone, oh, look, Batman's in this, when I'm thinking, does he really need to be in that film? The two examples I go to is uh, Batman Assault on Arkham. You could have easily just taken Batman out and made a Suicide Squad film because really he was only there to for promotional use. And the other one was Justice League Dark. Why on earth is Batman getting involved with this, the supernatural side of things? Like, he has done in the past, but not to, to this extent. So, Rob, I'm going to go to you first. Being the Batman nut that you are, does DC have a bat problem? I love the fact mm-hmm. that even I'm compared to a nut now is, uh, is being played into question, because yes, I suppose I am. Um, but um, yes, Batman nut. Um, <laughs> you want to get nuts? You want to get nuts? <laughs> Come on, let's get nuts. <laughs> Still one of the greatest pieces of acting I've ever seen. So in answer to your question, as, as, as strange as this sounds, I mean, I love my Batman, don't get me wrong, and I like my content. It's a lot like the Star Wars thing for me. Like, I love my Star Wars. I do feel like there's a lot of 
Star Wars out there right now. But in regards, you know, I wish there was less of it so there's more excitement to when we do see something new with with those characters. And this is in regards to Star Wars. I wish there was something more fresh or something exciting to lead up to it because I like getting excited for when something new comes around. And I remember being really excited as a child waiting for Batman Begins. But if there is a consistent, you know, new thing of Batman coming out again and again and again and again, it just becomes routine and it becomes too safe. And it comes back to that word that I said before with these movies is they do play it safe a lot of the time. And I do think Warner Brothers are... They do have a bat infestation, yes, is the question is the answer to your question. I do think think they do. And I do think the examples you've given are very solid. And I would add Batman Soul of the Dragon to that list. I, I won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen the film, but you know, when he is in there, he's he's good. But when he's not in there, you don't miss him. That's the really strange thing about it, is when he's not in the scenes, you know. It's funny because one of the characters played by Michael J. White, he calls him White Rice. And I loved that yeah. because I just thought that's the perfect way of... Well, first of all, it's a great like classic throwback to black exploitation cinema where they would call them, you know, white people turkeys. And, you know, giving Bruce the name White Rice, it just, it just perfectly sums him up. Because at one point I was going, where's White Rice? You know, I wasn't saying where's Batman. I was Because they, they basically sidelined, it, sidelined him and make way for these characters you know two new i i believe to be two new ones or from the comics from neil adams oh by the way it's a beautiful homage to neil adams's work by the way as well i i should say that and may he rest by the as, as well because um um his work on the series and in comics in general is is iconic and it's important as well to the characters not just for for batman but for dc in general so may he rest and uh, uh soul of the dragon did a wonderful job being influenced by his work in particular, especially the 70s era of Batman. And, but I do feel that, you know, it's easy, you know, some of the films, most of the films that we've spoken about on this list have been about Batman. Let's be honest. They have, you know, we, but for me, one of the best ones that I have seen on in this is the Wonder Woman film. I actually like the Green Lantern one as well, because I, I think they needed something once, you know, you know, I could go on for this for hours, of course, um, Jake, but once I saw the Green Lantern movie, you know, I had an argument for hours about that movie. But when I saw the Green Lantern Corps animated film, I was like, Do you know what? They should should have just done that, you know, and it's the same with it's the same with the Suicide Squad assault on Arkham. I just thought they should have just done this. I think now that they have built a reputation of being able to pull off you know, solid for the most part animation. Yes, safe in most areas. Great voice actors coming in, or actors, I should say, doing voice um, overwork. That maybe this is the time for them to just park Batman for a while and just say, do you know what? Let's make way for other characters you may not have, you know, been able to really explore before. I still think we should get like a Hawkman animated film or something. I reckon that would be great. I think we should. Also have John Stewart Green Lantern solo. I mean, I've I've said this many occasions. If there was like a live action film, I would do right now or greenlit, pun intended. I would <laughs> um, greenlight the John Stewart Green Lantern movie because for me, he is the most badass of all the Green Lanterns that we have. But also, he's probably the more interesting one and probably the most relevant one that we need right now. There's a reason they used him in the Justice League animated show. Dave, where, where do you where do you think to, uh, on this? Are you pretty much in agreement? Does DC have a bat problem? Yeah, I'm just getting images of somebody going into an attic and just getting loads of like animated Batman walking around. <laughs> 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 oh, who should we pick today, uh, Keaton or Kilmer? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I definitely think that is the case, and like the examples you give are perfect, and it, it just shows, isn't it? On the front cover of them, there's Batman, and you're like, "What? I thought this was a Justice League Dark storyline. What is he doing there?" So he does show up in some very questionable, strange properties, which don't seem to be linked to him as well. And to me, I I, I don't know if this is like controversial or what you guys think as Batman fans, but I also 
It's interesting with these films as well because they reflect so much of the decisions they make in the comics and because obviously certain creators of those storylines are involved and then the the wider adaptations of them as well. So, you know, I've said before, I've never been a big fan of Cyborg being like a part of the Justice League and stuff. I, I've never felt that makes sense. And I always feel that he's, even in these films, I always feel like he's shoehorned into it. And they're like, oh, what's a technological reason the Cyborg can be involved in this, you know, plot or, you know, something like that. And I never feel that he quite fits there. So it seems again that they're like putting him in there because they're like, oh, Cyborg's part of the Avengers. Uh, Avengers, a part of this. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> uh, Cyborg's a part of the Justice League now. We need to put him in all the animated movies so people accept that. So when the live action film comes out and he's there, people won't be like, he's not a Justice League member. But it still, to me, has always felt a bit shoehorned in. It's the same thing then with Batman that he just shows up in these situations, but also he becomes. To me, that's what I love about, you know, the the original cartoons and some of the films is, you know, he's a detective, he's a crime fighter, he, you know, beats up the bad guys and the criminally insane. But in a lot of these situations, he just becomes like Tony Stark or he becomes this other character. Like, I don't like how they're like, oh, there's an alien attacking Earth. We must go to Batman. I'm like, what? Why would you go to Batman? And like, it's like, <laughs> so in like Flashpoint, like the fact that he's like the go-to guy for like, everything that's happening with Aquaman and Wonder Woman. I'm like, why would Batman care about this stuff? Like what? I think it's just better when they keep these characters. To me, Batman is very much like Spider-Man. It's like, you need to keep him within New York City. You need to keep him within Gotham. I just don't think he works as well going into space, going into the magic realms and becoming like, I understand this all. And I know I'm a tech genius. I, I know all of this kind of stuff. I'm like, wasn't the idea of Batman that he does this job and then he has Alfred and Lucius Fox all to do the other stuff? And he he becomes that like every man within the Justice League. And it's especially hard to buy when you are watching a film of like Justice League characters and everyone's there shooting laser beams and, you know, using force fields and all kinds of stuff. And then he's just swinging around, throwing a Batarang around. Or even in Apocalypse War, you get like Batwoman and Batgirl there with just staffs and guns and I'm like, there's no way they would have survived this long when the green lantern has died but yet somehow batwoman has survived who's only got like a set of guns so yeah i just find they just they take it to new levels with him as well of changing the actual character but again i don't know if that's controversial or not i know he appears in the justice league a lot i'm not saying he shouldn't be in the justice league but he should have his role in the justice league as that detective character not just you know, again, it's kind of like Tony Stark, you know, oh, I fund everything. I, I make everything. We're in space because of me. It, it, it just doesn't align with the character to me. I agree with you, Dave, but I also think, you know, very much like with any comic book character, you can have different variations, different interpretations of these characters. And I feel as if on one aspect, there is a sort of Tony Stark aspect to Batman when he's with the Justice League, because he kind of has to be when you're a human, you know, facing world ending alien threats you know you almost have to up your game a bit in terms of the science department your gadgets and all that so for me it kind of makes sense that that is an aspect of batman but like you as a fan i prefer a more boots on the ground in the guttural streets of gotham batman that's the batman that i like you know taking on the criminals uh, my favorite type of batman is a detective noir type of batman which is why i'm so looking forward to what matt reeves has, has got up his sleeve because by all accounts that's that's looks like that's what we're going to get so and uh, which is why you know to this day batman the animated series is my favorite adaptation of batman and for most fans it is the ultimate representation of who batman is the noir detective guy on the streets you know constant in communication with the police but at, at times as well in war with them but with the live action stuff, they do have a bat problem. I'm just like, I, I, I when you know, upon what rewatching these movies, you know, because there is some really good Superman uh, films in these as well. It just made me kind of more angry that Warner Brothers can't get their live action Superman into gear. I'm just like, I, I, I just don't understand. You know what I mean? Like, if Marvel have got Tony Stark and Cap, DC should have Wonder Woman and Batman front and center like what are you doing like uh but 
at the same time, DC have a huge plethora of characters. It's insane that they're not utilizing more Green Lantern, more Wonder Woman, more Flash, Martian Manhunter, Blue Beetle, Booster Gold, like, you know, all these incredible characters. You know, they've done some Teen Titans movies, but go even more into, like, the, the different Titans and stuff like that. So it just seems wasted potential. It seems like they're punneling all this money into Batman, which I get as a business move makes sense because you will guarantee a return if it's got the Batman on it. But but at what point do people go, more, another Batman film? There is already people in the live action sense going, hang on, hang on. You're telling me we're getting Keaton, Affleck and Patterson like within the space of a, in the space of a year? You know, there's already some people a bit like, what the hell? Like, so, yeah, I think um, I think they need to tone it down on the bats. Do you think there should be more of an effort, maybe, now with how animation is looked at and treated these days, what would the success of, you know, the ever-growing success of, of Pixar, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, do you think DC should maybe spend more time, more of a budget to make a theatrical animated film? Rob, do you think... I mean, I think there's definitely plenty of stories and characters there that they could utilize to make something as successful as Into the Spider-Verse. What do you think? I absolutely 100% agree with that. I mean, I think back in 1993, I think they had it with Mask of the Phantasm, which, David, I know you said earlier, you know, was film which was, you know, targeted towards kids and stuff. But when you break it down... It, at its core, it's one of the most adult stories we've had from that, you know, character. And that's why many consider it to be one of not only one of the best Batman stories, but one of the best superhero movies ever made. And in my opinion, it is the best Batman film that has been made. But people yeah. can fight me on that. Yeah, I think the possibilities with this now are are endless. And I think one of the things you could do, absolutely, and it's not one of those things where you're just taking the idea you know it's almost like copying someone's homework you know with the spider-verse but i think you could do that with the green lantern core you know you have an insurmountable amount of green lanterns you know that's the appeal of them you know that there's more than one you know there's um obviously how there's um john but they've brought in you know the the first muslim um green lantern now which is amazing and and you know there there are so many you could do within that and to tell a grand story on that grander scale with, you know, in animation form, I think, and especially, you know, the powers of the Green Lantern, anything you can imagine can be brought to life. I mean, come on, guys. We should just pitch this to Warners right now. We, we need to pitch this to them. So, yeah, that's that's my answer on that one, for sure. What do you think, Dave? Do you think they should make an effort and release a theatrical cinematic animated film? When we can go back to cinemas, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. I think on the Green Lantern aspect, like Rob, I've I've said before that I'm a big advocate for uh, John Stewart. I think he should be like the live action version, etc. But these animated films do make me. If they're gonna go with Hal Jordan, I think you have to have Nathan Fillion. I want to see Nathan Fillion live action. <laughs> yes. He would be perfect for it. I think he, he he looks like the character. But yeah, I think that. I'm not sure. To me, I think that because Spider-Verse was such a unique property and there was that history of like the Spider-Man television shows, but he had never had a TV movie. I think that they then were able to sort of level up in that way. But I don't know if they will be able to escape the director DVD. And I'm, I don't want to say feel because obviously that would suggest that they're not going to make the film as good. But it might always have that hanging over it, if you know what I mean, because they've de because DC has become so well known for having these direct to DVD animated films, because there's such a big, you know, forty of them, as we said before, crazy, and all the, you know, Batman, Ninja, Ninja Turtles, all that kind of stuff, is the fact that there's, yeah, that precedence then for dc doing animation for that kind of level. So I don't know if they could ever escape that if they did one for the cinema i don't know if people then would react to it then like oh they're just releasing one of those in the cinema like the, the clone wars movie you know that just came off as oh they've just tacked three episodes together they've put it in the cinemas to try and get people in 
people might have that reaction unless it looked like crazy revolutionary kind of animation, which in some ways, you know, Spider-Verse did as well. But again, I, I just don't know in, in what way they could do it that would make it cinematic. And it would be very hard to, to shake the chains of people thinking, oh, well, this is just another DC animated movie, but they've just put it in the cinema this time. And I think, it, again, it would require... It would either re- require just a very, a very unique and completely different story, or it would just com- like it would require just completely different characters as well. So, it's it's like with that argument we're having at the moment as well of people saying, you know, once you do this, it becomes a streaming franchise, or you know, you're killing the the potential of that franchise having sequels and it being a cinematic release by putting these properties onto streaming and online. Um, so, you know, again, people might see an animated Batman or an animated Superman as kind of TV fear. And even, unfortunately, with Mask of the Phantasm, that didn't actually do that well at the box office, which was a shame. And so, you know, so maybe they just, if they do do it, maybe they just need to go completely different. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I also think maybe theatrical might be a bit of a stretch, but I think with streaming now, you know, it's it's a big competition, and I think one of those departments where a lot of streaming services are fighting for is their animation department. You know, Netflix has this huge anime section now. You know, that seems to be their big focus. Disney, obviously, famous with animation. They've got all their stuff. And, you know, HBO Max, if they want to also bring in some more fans in and stuff like that, maybe up the budget, but put it on HBO Max and make more of a thing of it. Do you know what I mean? I think that is also less risk as well. The fact that it, you could just go on streaming. Spider-Verse is kind of that blend with 3D and 2D, though. Could you see... I think... Am I right in thinking the only really 3D is the Green Lantern has had a history of 3D? So uh, Green Lantern guide... had a 3D animated show, yeah. Which is yeah. which is actually fantastic. So could I, I, I can't envision, you know, again, a lot of people will make the argument, oh, if you're going to level up to cinematic, you need to make it 3D because it just has that more cinematic and wider appeal. But I can't imagine the Batman, Superman, I can't imagine those characters ever in 3D as well. Is there any? Yeah, I agree with you that there is an element of that. But I push back on that because when you look at some of the Disney classics, how cinematic some of them are, and they're 2D, and the animation on them. A lot of the older Disney animation is so much better than the modern stuff, I feel. So, mm. you know, I think there's an argument to be made there about 2D animation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree. With, I agree. With, I was just about to say, I completely agree with on that point with the argument of 2D animation. Mm. But I just, I just wanted to say that I think, fundamentally speaking, I think if they just spent more time on the writing process as well because you have to remember these are being rolled out very quickly they're either taking from another source or they're they're maybe having a writing session for six weeks and then they're going into production you know we've seen that in live action form where they've written something in six weeks and then you get suicide squad sorry that was a bit Mm. of a dig i know but you know that is (laughs) the case it's the case you know if you rush if you rush the process and you don't have multiple drafts you know I'm 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 right now working on my first feature and one of the features I've written has been written over 5 years and I'm on my ninth draft of it. You know, it takes time to develop a cr- and craft a story. You know, you can't just write a story in, you know, some people can and fair play to them if they've got the money and budget to do that, but I guess it and we mentioned this earlier about budget and stuff. Taking the time to really craft something and having that budget there will get you so far and I think whether it's 3D animation or 2D animation, just crafting that story with multiple drafts will get you something special. But I didn't have to go easy on you. A different binding agent, a stronger mix. I want you to remember that. I wanted to remind you to stay out of my way. In all the years to come, in your most private moments, I want you to remember the one man who beat you. Right, so... Last question of this discussion, then. I'll start with you, Dave, and then I'll go, and then we'll end with our guest, Rob. What are your sort of top three favorite movies in this plethora of 40 movies? Um, I think for me, like, I haven't seen all 40. I've, and, uh, you know, I, um, I have missed a lot of, like, the big ones I know. So there's definitely ones that are on my watch list that I definitely want to check out, including, like, the sort of Batman ones. But 
you know, a lot of the time, again, the ones I've seen are the ones I'm like, oh, they, you know, that looks different. Those look like, you know, sort of different characters, so it sort of fits in within that mentality. One that sort of stuck out to me, uh, even though I said about Death of Superman before, I th- I felt that the reign of the super, uh, Superman was really great. I really enjoyed having those different versions of Superman. I think that that's quite a fun idea to play with. Uh, I really liked is it the Eradicator. That was like my favorite one just because it's just that like if Vision was Superman kind of thing. It was like a sort of robot Superman. I thought that was really fun. I thought the look of him was quite good. But it just wrapped up the entire story really well. It integrated Lois well into the storyline, their relationship, bringing back Superman. And there was that element of what we talked about before is that you know you were like oh yeah that, that that's where the black suit comes from oh i understand this bit more now it's you know it's learning about the original comic book run um so i thought that that was great uh, i know it's a controversial one but i i always enjoyed the teen titus judas contract i know a lot of people say that the original comic book run of that and the the storyline it doesn't pay tribute to that as well but I just felt that, again, watching this one, it was just comp- what we said about before where they all kind of feel the same or they're just a bit of, you know, condensed versions or watered down. I just felt with that one, it just had that bit more to it, a bit more depth and a bit more edge, which probably comes from the fact that it's such a great original story. So while I'm not saying that it it uh, matches the heights of that um, original story, I just felt that it benefited the film in that you had a more interest in character development with characters like Terra and Beast Boy, and you had the different interactions and the different problems. So they give each of the Teen Titans a, a, a problem that they're dealing with, like Blue Beetle. So I, I just appreciated the the effort that was taken with that one a bit more, whereas it wasn't just kind of like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if uh, we were going to war with this character? It was more about the characters, the teens themselves, and... Yeah, I just felt, and I felt that accumulated quite well in that sort of like end scene with Deathstroke and the the sort of betrayal, all of that added to the the drama of that. Then uh, probably one of my favorites would be uh, the Justice League Gods and Monsters because that goes down to the idea of like it being very original, very different, that whole Elseworlds idea of, you know, something we haven't seen before. Um, I love the idea of Batman as a vampire. I, I really, really <laughs> like that for some reason. I thought that was so cool. So yeah, I just felt that that one was really original. And I also felt it give us kind of maybe what we, we should have had in some respect in the in Flashpoint. I know a lot of people love that. And, you know, I do like elements of it. But I felt that there we had much more of the idea of like the Wonder Woman gone wrong and turned into this more like, you know, brutal warrior, etc., um, so I liked that aspect of it and there was the whole mystery and there was a, a bit of, you know, sort of wheel building an idea to like, oh, they need to be brought under control and all this kind of stuff. And I, I always enjoy that kind of stuff. So and I just like I, I think the designs of the characters are really cool as well. So, mm. yeah, th- those are sort of my my go to, you know, the ones that came to my mind anyway. Again, I've enjoyed like a lot of them, um, but those ones just stood out. It's very Dave of you to pick out the weirder, kooky ones, but yeah, uh, that, that, that's just your jam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For myself, um, I was trying to think, because there is some I really enjoy here, um, and I know me and Rob would probably agree on some of like the best ones, so I was thinking I'm going to pick a couple of different ones that I really like. For my third, I'm actually going to go with the one that's just come out, and that's Soul of the Dragon, Batman Soul of the Dragon. Uh, just because it is so original, well, I say original, like it's homaging all the movies that we saw in the 70s, but at the same time, it's original for the DC to tackle a genre like this. Me being a huge Bruce Lee fan as well of those 70s kung fu movies, and it had the mythology of, you know, all the dragons and stuff like that, and the fact that they, you know, didn't actually use Batman a lot. They, you know, focused more on the character, the persona of Bruce Wayne, which I totally loved. And also the soundtrack, just come on. Like that, it was phenomenal. 70s, chikwak, chikwak, loved it. Absolutely <laughs> loved it. My second is going to be a Superman one just because I feel as if the boy in blue doesn't get enough love these days. And I feel as if for people, especially I'm looking at you, Warner Brothers executives who don't know how to get a handle on Superman, just watch All Star Superman because that is, I would say, probably my favorite Superman story. Um, originally by Grant Morrison, art by Frank Quitely, which is 
just when those two pair up, it, it's amazing. And this is one of the DC animate movies, one of the adaptations that they were like, we can't fuck with this. We need to do this basically panel by panel, frame for frame. So it is a perfect adaptation. I'd say there's a little changes, but it doesn't affect the story in, in any way. And I feel as if if people want to get a really good representation of Superman, this is the one you should watch. And then my number one, to no surprise, is Batman The Dark Knight Returns. It is my favorite Batman comic, my favorite interpretation of Batman, the older, grizzly, more Robert type of Batman. And I, I just I watched these as well, part one and part two, as a feature length film because... I feel as if it's the most cinematic. The score is phenomenal. The sound design, the cast is incredible. Peter Weller is in the top three voice cast of Batman of all time. I, he's probably number two for me after Kevin Conroy. And it's phenomenal in every way. Uh, but Rob, I go to you now with your three choices. So all of the choices that you've picked so far, lads, are probably in my, you know, kind of like top ten because we can say that because there are 40 of them. But for me, I'm going to go with... So they're not in particular order, but I appreciated the Jason Todd character before, but I fell in love with it even further when I read and watched Under the Red Hood. So I watched Under the Red Hood first, and then I went back to the comic, which I never normally it's the other way around. And I was blown away by how grounded and how heartbreaking it was watching basically a father and son relationship break down to the point where it's it's down to i'm not i don't hate you i don't you know I, I forgive you for not saving me but why won't you kill one one person who tried to kill me you know that's what it comes down to and it's just a magnificent set piece finale where it's not about the explosions it's not about fist fights or anything else it's about the what it means to bring justice and what is their moral codes of it all with everything i think that for me is quite a pivotal moment in not just that movie but in dc animation in particular where they realized they could actually find that balance between heart and action my next choice is um justice league war i really enjoyed mm. the comic and there are certain beats of the comic that i was like Mm, okay um oh, you know i get why you're going that route i'm not sure if i quite fully go with you on that but then they do rewrite some aspects within this especially the fact that aquaman's not in this it's uh it's shazam is replaced instead the banter between batman and green lantern in particular is also fantastic and that's just something i wish we'd seen in in the justice league and and unfortunately we got the justice league instead which was Sorry, I, know, I didn't pronounce that pretty, pretty well, so uh, yeah, forgive me. But there's more banter and interaction between these characters, and there's more heart to these characters in that animated film than there is in the Justice League that we got. And then finally, I was originally going to say Dark Knight Returns, but I'm going to refer back to Batman Year One because, again, you've got, for me, where it all began, where I read that comic quite young, and for me, I had a big pre appreciation for the character. It wasn't the first story I read um, that lies with the, a one-off issue called Fatal Wish. But Batman Year One for me was the moment where I realised, OK, you can tell really great stories without necessarily have to being focused on Batman, but on a human character's Jim Gordon. And I thought they did a terrific job of actually bringing it to life through animation and with these voice actors. And we come back to Andrea Romano with the stellar casting of Brian Cranston as J uh, Jim Gordon, because I can't think of anyone else who, I mean, I could think of probably some others after I get off uh, this podcast with you guys now, but Brian Cranston's performance alone is just so raw. It's so honest. It's so heartbreaking uh, in moments like, the moment for me that sticks out is when he's got the gun in his hand and he's at the end of the bed and his wife's there sleeping and she's pregnant and he's he's lost all hope. And then in the window, which they're able to do in animation, is they just have a quick kind of zoom and pan around and, it, and it's just Batman in the background running across and you just go... <sighs> it's, 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 you know, it takes your breath away, those little bits here and there. 
And when animation is able to do that, um, you and you forget that you're watching an animation. I think that's when you've really you you've really na- hit the nail on the head there. And Batman Year One made me forget I was watching an animated movie, and I was I was engrossed. It was immersive, and it was it was literally the comic brought to life, and it was beautiful. All fantastic choices. They were a couple of my choices initially, but I thought, you know what, I'll let Rob have them. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll look for a couple of others. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that pretty much brings us to the end of the show now. Rob, it's been a huge pleasure to have you on the show, to have your insight and knowledge into DC, being a huge DC guy yourself. So uh, before we go, we always like to plug away. Uh, where the people and listeners can find you and what stuff are you getting up to at the minute? Um, so guys, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, as an avid listener, it's been great to actually just uh, to hear you guys um, talk about what you love, which is, of course, um, comics and movies and TV shows. Like It's literally one of the highlights of my week, to be honest with you, just to get to listen to you guys talk and be enthusiastic and Part of me, even as as stupid as it sounds, sometimes I even just respond with, uh, uh, "Oh yeah, I'm not there." Um, <laughs> but that's the power. That's the power of podcasts, there for you. And actually, now to be able to do that on a Sunday has been great. It's been like nice. It's been nice to just uh, chat away to you guys and just be like, you know, talk about this. And but guys, you can reach out to me on at Rob Ailing on Instagram at Rob Ailing on Film on Twitter. Um, I have made a Batman fan film called Living in Crime Alley. Uh, which is now available on YouTube. It is the story of a single father trying to bring up their daughter in Park Row, aka Crime Alley. And uh, yeah, it's um, it's done all right, I think. <laughs> I think uh, it's done pretty good. It's pretty done good. pretty. It's yeah. done pretty good. And um, yeah, just right now, I'm just in development of my first feature film and uh, working on some new short films. In particular, I released a film that I made in lockdown which has um, since its release been selected to a, a couple of festivals worldwide and just recently picked up its first award, which was really nice. And um, yeah, I'm just um, still creating as a filmmaker, even in these uncertain times, which I think is the most important thing we do right now is we keep the communication going first and foremost, but we keep creating as well. Couldn't have said it better myself, Rob. Dave, what about you, man? Yeah, well, yeah, thank you for those kind words as well, Rob. And yeah, I definitely echo what you say about the creating and all that kind of stuff. It is really important. And um, you don't want to be squashed by other people who say, oh, go get a different job and all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, this stuff is important right now because we're entertaining people during lockdown, etc. So, uh, but not just us. I'm talking about, you know, the big... (laughs) just us, Dave. Well, Well, you know, our dreams are to be like Kevin Smith. We'll be animated into one of these DC films one day. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, doing the podcast with uh, Beast Boy yeah you can catch me on uh, Twitter at David Osgar that's O-S-G-A-R and you can catch me on Letterboxd under the same name and uh, where you can see uh, me review the big contrast of films I had this week which was you know watching the Fifty Shades franchise for another podcast, and then watching a bunch of DC animated films right after. It, which is like, what, what, what a contrast that was! Um, in which one of my reviews for Fifty Shades is pretty much a biography of Mary Queen of Scots because I thought that would be more interesting than the actual movie itself. So yeah, I've got quite a few interesting reviews on there you can check out. So go look at all of that stuff, and yeah, I got some fun and. Uh, Great projects coming up soon as well. And uh, you can catch me as well reviewing WandaVision on freshtakehub.com and on this podcast with Jake and Tom. You can also catch me on Twitter at Sweaty Jake and I'm also on Letterbox at Jake Hart. Yes, as Dave said, you can get caught up with WandaVision. We are doing weekly review episodes. The first five episodes are already up. And over here, we're all loving that show and doing the show as well with uh, Tom Gapper. So please check that out. And also find us on Twitter. We're also on Twitter at Capes, Cows and Mass and Facebook. And wherever you listen to us, Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, give us a subscri- subscribe, a follow. And if you're feeling generous on Apple as well, give us a review as it all helps. So yeah, spread the word of CCM to all your friends. And with that, everyone, stay safe. Take it easy. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>